Who are you to judge? Today, more often than not, that's an insincere question asked rhetorically by someone who does not like having the light of God shining brightly upon his or her sins. The great Puritan preacher, John Flavel, put it this way, Sin is so shameful a thing that it does not like to go by its own name. So men work hard to cover and shroud themselves under the pretense of equity and tolerance. But for the Christian, we are not to be moved by the boldness and perseverance of Christ's enemies. No, not one hair's breadth. Be sure to stand on good ground, and then resolve to stand your ground against all the world if necessary. Follow God and fear not men. Art thou godly? Then repent not whatsoever thy religion cast thee. Let sinners repent, not saints. Let saints repent of their faults, but not of their faith and equities, but not of their righteousness. Repent not, therefore, of your zeal, or your forwardness, or your activity in the holy ways of the Lord. Wish not yourselves a step further back, or a cubit lower in your stature, in the grace of God. Wish not anything undone concerning that which God will someday say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. How would you react if someone were to break into your home and kidnap your children? You say, well, thankfully, that won't happen. Our doors are locked, the alarm is on, and the police are available to catch the criminal. You would be willing to die to protect your children. But what if I were to tell you that children, and even children in Christian homes, are being stolen right from within their homes? The enemy comes through locked doors and bolted windows. To be sure, the bodies of the children are still left in their rooms but their hearts have been lured to serve other masters. More surprising is the fact that many parents are in cahoots with these thieves. If children in their early 20s were stolen, we might argue that they are old enough to fend for themselves. But young children, talking about ages 12 and 13, they are being lured away while their parents tend to the matter of living and are consumed with their own agendas. Who are these thieves that have come to capture the hearts of our children and already rule the hearts of many adults? In a word, they are the various media outlets, the entertainment industry that has targeted our children for a massive takeover. Yes, that includes movies, the internet, and the music industry. We want people to laugh at adultery, homosexuality, and incest, said one script writer, because laughing breaks down their resistance to these things. Now just think about this. Far more than half of the children under 18 years of age have seen X-rated movies, and 25% tried to copy what they saw within days of seeing the material. Next, we have rap music with its dirty lyrics, its obscene language, and violent sexual images. These words and feelings embed themselves into the minds of our teenagers. Words and images loaded with immoral values and impulses find a home within their hearts. Follow me, do exactly what the song says. Smoke weed, take pills, drop out of school, kill people and drink. Follow me, do exactly what the song says. Smoke weed, take pills, drop out of school, kill people and drink. So how much of Hollywood should we allow into our homes? Our first test is the content test. Asking ourselves if the movie or video or internet material that comes into our home pleases the Lord. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. 
The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Now why is the love of the world so serious? You know, if we love sin, we not only love what God hates, we love what put Jesus Christ on the cross. Let's just suppose that your son was murdered. Would you keep the knife that killed him in a special case so that it could be admired? Would you tell your friends, just look at how sharp that blade is and look at its beautiful symmetry? Just so, when we love sin, we love what killed Jesus. How much of Hollywood should we let into our homes? Run it past the content test. Does it ignite my innate desire for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life? Is this the kind of movie or music that I would watch if I had Jesus over for dinner? Let's answer this question candidly. Are we in control of the entertainment we allow in our lives? Or are we driven, perhaps even obsessed, with the need for movies, music, or the internet? And remember that even the good can be the enemy of the best. In order to humble yourself before God, ask yourself, which kingdom do I spend more time thinking about, Christ's or the world's? But can you give a defense of your faith to anyone who asks? Can you explain, for example, the doctrine of the atonement or the difference between justification and sanctification? Do you know how to lead someone to Christ? Are you burdened with a desire to see people come to Christ? Has that burden ever kept you up at night? Or has it only been David Letterman or some late night movie? Next, ask yourself, to which kingdom am I the most loyal? Again, the best gauge here is not necessarily what we say, but what we do, particularly when the principles of God's kingdom clash with those of the world. When Hollywood, for example, blasphemes our God or glamorizes sin, do you make a stand or take a fall? Do you, as King David said, hate the work of those who fall away? Or do you allow it entrance to your heart? Does the music you listen to exalt God or the flesh of man? Does it build up or tear down? Does it purify or pollute? Are you weeping beside the rivers of Babylon? Or have you, like so many in today's church, gone in for a little swim? And finally, ask yourself, in which kingdom am I investing my money? This question relates very closely to the other three because, as Jesus pointed out, where your treasure is, your heart, with its time, affection, and loyalties, will be there also. Paul now gives us the final test. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. When Paul says we should, quote, make the most of every opportunity, end quote, the Greek word is that we must redeem the time. That is, we must buy the time out of the marketplace. There are so many demands for our time today that we have to make time for things that matter to God. Knowing that we are up against a power that is greater than ourselves, we must prayerfully take some steps to limit if not eliminate the impact of the entertainment industry in our own lives and the lives of our children. We have to respect our homes, the place where attitudes are formed and lifestyles are developed.